where does the ordinariate of the chair of St. Peter come from? It's one of three uh, ordinariates that have been erected in the church according to the Apostolic Constitution, Anglican Arm Chaiti, which was, which, which was published in November of 2009. These, there's a one in England and Wales, then one in North America, and one in Australia, and attendant territories, I should say. So I'm responsible for North America. Uh, Monsignor Entwistle um, from Perth, Australia, is in charge of like the Pacific Ocean. So he has <laughs> Australia, but um, uh, he also had there's an ordinary community, for example, in Japan. Uh, and there was recently uh, an, ordinary, uh, an Anglican parish in Manila that was trying to join us, and I managed to convince the Holy See that wouldn't that be much better with Australia? <laughs> so I don't have to go <laughs> These things flow from an ecumenical vision of uh, Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI. Uh, ultimately, during his 24 years, as prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, uh, he became, I would say, um, critical of the trend, the direction of. Uh, oh, Bishop is here. I told him I wouldn't. I wouldn't embarrass him, and I just did it. <laughs> now I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> The vision of, of, of Pope Benedict XVI was formed by, you know, while he was prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, a lot of the archic dialogues, the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission dialogues were ongoing, and in his mind, going nowhere, uh, because they would, they would uh, arrive at, at statements, and then it was like there was no place for those statements to be received. You know, what did the Catholic Church really understand about um, orders and, and Eucharist and, and other things about the life uh, of the Anglican Communion? How did, it, how did the Church respond officially uh, to, the, to the agreed statements of the Arctic Dialogue partners? And then when you flipped it to the other side, to the Anglican side, before you, you, you got to the what did they think about this, you had to ask the first question, well, who's there to respond? Because it turns out, you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury speaks for the Archbishop of Canterbury, you know, and there are other primates and the other bishops, you know, maybe not so much, you know, so there was, there was, there, what did all of this mean, where was it going? And at the same time, on the broader ecumenical scene, we noticed a change in presumptions. If you read the Second Vatican Council document on ecumenism, it presumes very clearly that the ecumenical impulse responds to the command of Christ. So we do this, you know, because we have to, because Jesus said so, we, you know, praying that they all might be one. So the point of ecumenical dialogue is the full, visible, sacramental communion of the church. That there would be a church in which all were one, and all were celebrating the same Eucharist, we would say, a valid Eucharist. I, I don't know that that's necessarily uh, what all what ecumenists have in mind anymore. It's like, you know, you hit the roadblocks on the way to that, and so, you know, it's like the GPS thing, you know, rerouting, rerouting. <laughs> and so now, if you will, the aims and the presumptions of a lot of ecumenical dialogue are different. Uh, big in vogue now is receptive ecumenism. That's where we step away from trying to push towards unity. We step away from, um, you know, uh, therefore a more expository explaining this is why we do what we do, this is why we believe what we believe, towards a more let me try to figure out what it is that we can learn from you. You know, what can we receive from you? Well, that's great, and there's value to that, but that's, it, is that necessarily going towards the full visible sacramental communion of the church? So, during this period, he, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger is also aware of certain movements within the church for precisely that kind of 
uh, dialogue that brings about that full visible unity. And so 1982, he was prefect for, gosh, six months at this point, um, the articulation of the pastoral provision in the United States. So a mechanism whereby Anglican and other Protestant ministers uh, could be ordained Catholic priests, even as married men, in favor of the work that they were doing and the ministry that they had faithfully exercised for years as Protestants. And it really, the, the, the church at that point did not articulate the why, why we would do this. It just articulated the how, you know, how we would go about reconciling some of those folks. The first, by the way, to uh, grant a dispensation for a Protestant minister who was a married man to be ordained, therefore a married Catholic priest, was Pius XII. So, I mean, this does have some antecedents uh, in history. As that, as that conversation and that experience grows, um, the question changes. By about 2006, 2007, you know, uh, the question shifts because it's no longer just individual pastors asking to be ordained Catholic priests. But the question is being presented in this way. Uh, Most Holy Father, you know, I'm ready to go and do whatever you want me to go and do. You know, in terms of being formed, in terms of whatever, so that I can be ordained a Catholic priest. Here's the thing. What do I do with all these people of whom I am pastor? Who want to follow me into full communion? Because actually it's our relationship. You know, I am their pastor. You know, I, you know, they have been entrusted to my pastoral care. I would feel as if I were abandoning them if I just went and you know figured my own stuff out. Now, if that's what you want me to do, that's what I'll do. But see, it was posing the question in favor of the relationship enjoyed with their parishioners. And the Holy See, the Vatican, received. Um, six or so of, the, of, of requests of this type within a very short period of time, within the period of about 10 months, you know, which in, in, in Vatican time is like a blink of an eye, you know. <laughs> um, and so immediately the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith was tasked with studying this and with, uh, with articulating a response. But, you know, Pope Benedict XVI is nothing if not a theologian. So it's not going to be enough for him just to say the how we do this, you know, the canonical structures of creating a non-territorial diocese or whatever, but also the why, why we would do this. And he spoke of, um, Anglican Orm Chedi was really kind of advances a vision of what ecumenism could, I would say should, look like. Because it shows, I mean, there are fundamental principles there that can be drawn right out of that vision of the Second Vatican Council that are not articulated elsewhere in the church. One of them is this, that the unity of faith allows for a diversity in the expression of that faith. So if you believe the content of the faith, the doctrine of the faith, how you express it in liturgy, in liturgy, in prayer, in devotion, in theological language, well, that's, that's legitimate. And so one of the things that the Apostolic Constitution does is give space for a liturgical expression of the Roman Rite. Our liturgy is a Roman Rite liturgy, but the way that the Roman Rite was taken up and developed and expressed in a particularly English context over the course of 500 years of ecclesial separation, Anglicans you know, splitting off from Rome, and now coming back together. So the question is, is the Catholic faith, you know, this is, you know, this is still the Catholic faith, uh, it's still the Manx, is the way that that was developed in Anglicanism enriching? It's different. Those of you who go to Mass here, you know, on Sunday at St. Albans, realize, okay, yeah, it's, it's the Mass, but there are differences, you know, kind of throughout. But if it's enriching, 
why wouldn't we keep it? Because isn't it the way that these people who call themselves Anglicans, the way that they pray, the way that they celebrate Mass and the sacraments, the way that they have lived their Christianity, isn't that the very thing that brought them to say, hey, you know what, we want the fullness of Catholic truth, and so we want full communion. And if it brought them there, then, then saying, okay, all you people, thanks, now stop that and go celebrate Mass this other way. Which is what we did, right? I mean, you joined our CIA and, and you were integrated into the regular diocesan life. You know, Pope Benedict XVI was saying, well, no, true ecumenism isn't afraid of a diverse expression as long as the faith is the faith. You know, and uh, there was a moment in the process where a group of, of Anglican bishops understood it. I mean, you saw the light bulb finally kind of go on. Like, oh, okay, I get this. They bought a copy of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and they all signed it and handed it, you know, to the Holy Father, as if to say, this is our faith. You know, so the ecumenical value even of something like the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So a unity of faith brings a diversity of expression. The favored pastoral relationship between a priest and his faithful. That what we would do in, in practice was not mess that up. You know, that we would try to conserve that relationship of uh, in the passage into full communion as something essential and expressive of parish life. Then, you know, so the, these are the elements that structure. Then the Pope said something like this. He, he used the P word, patrimony. The spiritual, liturgical, and pastoral patrimony of Anglicanism as that which nurtures the faith of the faithful of the ordinariate as a treasure to be shared. That's Anglican Norm Chady, who's Article 3. What is Anglican patrimony? Ask 15 people and you get 16 answers to that. <laughs> you know, and, and the first thing to remember is this, it doesn't matter. The fact is that the Pope has said it exists. And it wasn't Pope Benedict XVI who said it exists. It was Pope Paul VI. Pope Paul VI was the, the first to use the phrase Anglican patrimony officially. He did it in the canonization of St. Charles Lwanga and Companions, the martyrs of Uganda, because the Catholic martyrs of Uganda were martyred right alongside an equal number of Anglican martyrs. So he could not not acknowledge that. And so he talked about this, this patrimony. And then all of the Benedict, what Benedict XVI does, he says, well, it's a patrimony for them, for those who come into full communion that which nourishes their faith, that which has brought them to desire the fullness of truth and the fullness of communion. But it's also a treasure to be shared. And now that, first of all, is wonderful and makes all sorts of people uncomfortable. <laughs> because he says, you know, what that means, it's a treasure to be shared with the whole church. That there is something about the way the faith was lived and celebrated and verbalized, expressed in an English context that actually is an enrichment for the whole church. <clears throat> now, he's not saying that every Catholic now has to do this thing, no, but he, what he's saying is, well, first of all, it's Mass, and so any faithful Catholic who decides to go to an ordinary Mass on Sunday fulfills their Sunday obligation, you know, you, if you want to get down to that level of... <laughs> But more than that, will recognize something that is authentically theirs, their faith, but it expressed in a different way. Expressed in a way, um, in a felicitous manner, you know, in, to, to use uh, his language, that, that, that somehow captures something new. Because, you know, we all get comfortable. We all get, you know, it, things that are familiar are helpful, but you know, sometimes in the spiritual life, when things get too familiar, we tend to take them for granted, right? So, you know, it's, it's, it's hearing the Mass differently in this context. That there is something 
that will stir us. Um, our liturgical language is English, but it, it preserves English as a sacral language. So the way, the idiom of our missal is religious English. It's not Shakespearean, it's not Elizabethan, you know, it's, it's I mean, the, these are things that people say. But it's a, it's a type of English that is formed not by the secular development of society in England, but secular development of society was influenced by the language of the Psalter and the Bible, specifically the King James uh, and, and the language of the Psalms. And so when our, you know, our language in English will, will use words and use phrases differently Interestingly, it preserves uh, the, the, what we have all lost in English. You know, uh, those of you who know some uh, Spanish or, or German or French, you know, there's the difference between the formal form of address and the informal, tu and usted in Spanish, all the way around. You know, uh, our mass uh, preserves that. God is always addressed in the informal <coughs> because of the relationality. Thee and thou are informal. You is formal. So in, in, in the way that the English language developed, we dropped the informal altogether. And we're just refer you know, when you say you, you're you're referring to the other person in a in the formal form of English address. There are these little distinctions that actually have theological significance. The way that uh, you know it's not just language, it's also uh, a rhythm of prayer. It's a rhythm of monastic prayer. And so there's a, there's a lot more scripture. Because, um, you know, liturgical folks you know, will say that our Mass restores, you know, the introit, the gradual, the offertory, the communion, you know, all the tract, all of these various chants during the Mass. Well, you no, know, there's scriptural touchstone that are there specifically because they're supposed to take up and continue resonating the, uh, throughout the Mass the phrases that are used in the readings, you know, so that when you go to Mass in Epiphany, on Epiphany, you know, Psalm 73 uh, about the kings of Tarshish and the sea coasts paying homage to the true king is going to be, uh, it, it, we hear it, it's the first reading of Mass, um, but or, and the responsorial psalm, but then it's it's wended all the way through the liturgy as like this 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 thread that you know because what do we do at mass? We lose our place. We stop paying attention. We you know <laughs> and you know what these things are supposed to do is like no back here. <laughs> you know they 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 grab us. You know so this idea of mutual enrichment. Um, is, is precisely that. It's, it's mutual in that it is thoroughly Catholic. In fact, when on the liturgical side, when we were putting together, and I'm using liturgy as the primary example, it's not the only example, and I hope you're talking about some other things other than that, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's, you know, liturgy is also one of the most tangible things, because if, no if someone doesn't know anything about the ordinariate, what are they gonna do? They're gonna go to Mass. You know, and they're going to experience that. You know, so it's a it's a tangible. Um, it's thoroughly Catholic. You know, it it it, it takes up uh, the, uh, the the insights of the way that the church has prayed, and yet it brings to it uh, this whole ang idea of Anglican patrimony, the way that it developed in an English context. You know, um, and it's and it's it, it, so it's it's focused kind of on monastic rhythms on. On, on patristic language, on the English language of theology, uh, atonement. You know, we have words of when we speak about what Christ's sacrifice accomplishes. You know, we would use words like sanctification and redemption, and uh, well, you can even use substitution and all. You know, there's all these theological words, right? They're all Latin. They're all Latin. Atonement is the only word without a Latin antecedent. It is the contribution, if you will, of English theology to Catholic theological discourse. 
And so the word atonement, you know, does come. He atones for our sins, uh, you know, it, it is woven through, you know, our, our way of praying as well. That doesn't contradict the Catholic faith. It expresses it in a different way. Um, mutual enrichment, you know, we, we learn the ebb and flow of Catholic life from the Catholic Church. But our ordinary parishes are differently structured. Uh, Cardinal DiNardo in Houston said to me once in his great smokers, well, you people linger over liturgy. Well, it's kind of true, but it's not just the liturgy, it's the coffee hour after. <laughs> you know, that this becomes very important because, you know, uh, because our communities are formally, uh, many of them are, come, are, are formally Protestant, there's an idea, a, a, a sense of parish as family that we used to have as Catholics. I grew up with it. You know, I mean, there was no question where you would be at 6 o'clock on Friday during Lent, you know? <laughs> Stations of the Cross, followed by fish fry. You know, well, I can guarantee you in Northern California, few and far between would be the churches that still did that kind of thing. You know, and so when you have my home parish had 5,500 families in it, uh, 11 masses on a weekend. It didn't take long to feel anonymous, you know. So the, the, what the ordinary parishes do is they 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 try uh, intentionally to recapture that sense, and so it is kind of expected that you go to coffee hour after mass, you know, the ducking out the side aisle thing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was very proud. I, I was at the parish in Orange County, here at Orange County. But yeah, we go. So, you know, in Orange County, there we were, we had mass, I, you know, did the half an hour thing. The mass takes place at a chapel at a law firm, essentially. Uh, Our Lady of Life Chapel, it fits 100 people or so, great, but, you know, that means the bishop has to kind of go to lunch with the guy who runs the office, you know, to say thank you for letting us use your place. So away we go, we go to a place, we have lunch, you know, what lunch is, an hour or so. And he drops me back off at the, at the chapel because that's where I left my car. I had to find a bathroom, run around the side. There stands my priest, you know, glass of wine in one hand, cigar in the other. <laughs> and about 40 people. Mass ended two and a half hours before. <laughs> so I go over there and what are you people doing here? And they, they looked at me, but there was wine left. Let's take a nice foot for another 30 minutes with them, you know. But that was the thing, that, that it became an event. <laughs> Sunday Mass was still that idea of event. There are several of our parishes that still do a full lunch every, every Sunday, because, you know, um, a potluck thing. And when parishes start getting large, like the Cathedral Parish in Houston, where we have about uh, 760 families, you know, it's starting to get uncomfortable. You know, so the inclination, the impulse immediately is not to build a bigger church. We need to go found some mission parishes. Mm -hmm. And so in procession, we go to the woodlands in North Texas, and we'll be opening up a new parish or a new mission there uh, in January, precisely you know, because I know we have about 35 families commuting down from the woodlands to, to where we are in Spring Branch, Houston, which is about a 45 minute drive. You know, the idea is to, no, 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 because if it gets too large, we lose something essential. You know, I don't know how to recreate that model of intentional communities in larger Catholic parishes where you have several thousand families, but I know we have to do it. And I know that our ordinariate folks are going to have an insight and are going to be able to help in that. Because, you know, the, the feeling of anonymity in church is the, is the first, you know, especially for millennials. This is an interesting thing, you know, where we're talking a lot about millennials and how they experience religion, how they go to church. If, um, if you know, if you listen to millennials, if they say, you know, the, the most deadly thing, it's not the teachings of the church that they object to, it's not the contraception thing or, you know, anything like that, it's that sense of anonymity. If it doesn't matter if I'm there, then it doesn't matter if I'm not there. 
<laughs> and frankly, I have other things I'd like to do on Sunday. So, you know, there it is. That's the thought process. Well, it's not really a thought process. That's the feeling process that so many, that so many go through, you know. So that's an area uh, of mutual enrichment. It's that idea, again, it all comes back to, and then I'm going to stop because I said I wasn't going to talk forever. <laughs> uh, it's that idea that, that Pope Benedict came to. It's, it's why the ordinary, why Anglican Arm Shady was the, the document that gives it its, its, uh, its, its foundation. It's to create a space that those who are coming into full communion don't lose their self, don't lose themselves, they don't lose their essential identity. You know, it's, 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 it's unity, it's diversity in unity. It's unity without assimilation. Uh, and so it creates a space for them. But it's also an enrichment to the whole church because in that space, the very same faith once delivered to the saints is going to be taken up, it's going to be lived, it's going to be expressed. Is it going to be universally applicable in every parish? No, of course not, and that's not meant to. But it's meant to be its own thing that the rest of the church can drop into and be refreshed in some way in their, in their faith. It doesn't mean it has to be replicated in every parish. We don't have that kind of time on Sunday mornings. As you know, our mass is a little longer than but you know, nevertheless, it's it's something true, it's something good, and it's something beautiful. And so that that sense that it's therefore in service to the gospel. And thirdly, so it's for the people in the ordinary, it's for the Catholic community in general. And thirdly, what Pope uh, Benedict the Sixteenth has created is a new model for ecumenism. And he did this very intentionally. Look and see what's possible. As the mainline denominations disintegrate, look and see what's possible. It is possible to come into full communion with the Catholic Church and not lose something essential about your own identity. And so uh, in, in the years following 2009, there was a bit of a road show uh, from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. We began reconciling parishes and communities, for example, in the Church of Sweden which is Lutheran, um, same kind of idea. Because they looked at that, they saw, they got it, in other words. And they said, yeah, we want that too. Um, and, and, and Swedish Lutheranism is very different uh, from, from the more Calvinist strains down south. But you know, so there's, there is more of an ecclesial reality there that, that, that we could do. But it's, the, it's that same kind of model. And so it poses the question differently. Um, and that, those, those are, if you will, are the three audiences uh, that Pope Benedict XVI was, um, was addressing himself to. Because, you know, very simply, what is the new evangelization? It's witnessing to the world, to not only the truth of God in Christ, but the happiness of the people that give themselves over to that truth. And so, you know, it's that winsome, joyous living out of the faith that is going to ultimately attract people uh, into that relationship, that life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ. And so if we can, if we can nurture that in these, various, uh, uh, in these various ways, then it, of course, is in service to the new evangelization in a very direct way. All right, that's what I got. Thank you.